You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Hello everyone and welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I am Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics. I want to start by apologizing actually for the last couple of weeks. Uh, circumstances beyond our control, our interview with Rosalia Butterfield was pushed back because she came down with an illness. A lot of you are asking about the interview with Michael Heiser, where he had a power outage. Fortunately, the curse did not strike my guest today. <laughs> we we're talking about abortion, which is what I do in January. All month long, we talk about abortion generally. And a, a few months or so ago, my wife found a book online, browsing Facebook, called Pro Choice in Christian by Kira Schlesinger, who I understand is an Episcopalian priest, uh, priestess. And we passed it on to our guest, who went through it and thought, yep, usual kind of thing, and even offered to come on the show to talk about it. And I suggested, why don't we try and set up a debate? And I want you all to let you all know, I tried to get in touch with Kira Schlesinger. I sent a message to her church asking if she'd like to come on. We never heard back. So it wasn't for lack of trying, but we tried. But our friend who we sent to is someone who has been on the show before, and he's Clinton Wilcox. Who is he? He's a staff apologist with Life Training Institute and a certified speaker and mentor with Justice for All. Clinton specializes in training pro-life people to make the pro-life case more effectively and persuasively. Clinton is also a prolific writer. He has had two articles published of Christian Research Journal and one with one forthcoming as well as having a forthcoming article published in Bioethics, one of the top five leading bioethics journals in the world with co-authors Daniel Roger and Bruce Blackshaw. So, uh, Clinton, welcome back to the Deeper Waters podcast. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate you having me back on. Yeah, and I let everyone know we're only going to be going for an hour and a half today due to timing and things like that and such. And we were having some fun in a, a chat kind of earlier. You posted on my blog about how it said, you said a prolific writer and you've got four articles there mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, I was reading the article that you posted about our upcoming broadcast here, and I was thinking, you know, I I mentioned I, I wrote down I'm a prolific writer, but then I only mentioned four articles, and so I was thinking that I, I probably should have mentioned that I, I write for several blogs, including uh, my own personal blog, the Life Training Institute blog, Secular Pro Life. Um, and I've had articles published on Life News, Life Site News, the National Pro Life Committee blog, uh, and various other blogs, including Jay Warner yeah. Wallace's Please Convince Me blog and certain mm. other ones. Okay, glad we got that taken care of. Now, <laughs> right. you have been on here before, but in case my audience doesn't remember you, can you uh, remind us about how you got to be doing what you're doing? Yeah. A um, little bit of a of a long story, uh, but I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, basically, after I got out of high school, um, I started taking college courses, and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. I was just trying to get some of my general ed out of the way. And one of the classes that I took was a speech class, because I, I've always been really shy, kind of soft-spoken, especially before that point. And so I wanted to take the speech class to improve my interactions with people. So... In the course of that class, the third speech that we had to, to deliver on um, what had to be on a controversial topic. And we had to present it in such a way that it was balanced, that we couldn't let anyone listening know which side of the issue we fell down on. The issue that I sort of chose out of thin air was the abortion issue. I didn't really know much about abortion. I'd never really been faced with it, never uh, never felt that it was something I had to deal with, never having you know gotten anyone pregnant in high school or anything like that. I was always kind of a good kid, kept my nose clean, uh, those kinds of things. And uh, so I didn't really know much about it. And in the course of studying it, I started to understand it better, and I started to 
actually realize what it was. And I started to realize that the weight of the evidence was on the pro-life side. I didn't see, it wasn't the pictures that convinced me. I, I did come across a couple of those, but it wasn't the pictures that convinced me. It was really just the, the cold, hard facts of the matter, that the unborn are human from fertilization and that every every successful abortion kills uh, an unborn human being. And it wasn't just those facts, but the fact that um, I forget how, how much it was at the, at the time. It had increased since then, and it's decreased now. But uh, I think it was around a million at the time were happening every year. And so considering that these were unborn human beings that were being killed uh, to the tune of a million every year, I decided that it wasn't something that I could just remain silent about anymore. So I asked my pastor at my church if I could give a presentation, and he agreed. And I did that for a couple of years around the time of Roe v. Wade. And then... Um, a couple, and nothing really became of that. But a few years later, my sister knew that I was interested in doing something related to abortion and the pro-life cause. So she took me down to the local 40 Days for Life, which is being headed up by Rights Life of Central California, and Josh Brom, who at the time was the was the educational director at Right to Life of Central California, but he's since started his own organization called Equal Rights Institute with his brother Tim. Uh, my sister introduced me to him. And we met once, nothing became of it for about a year. But then after that, we became friends and we started uh, having these discussions. And then he started mentoring me and bringing me through the Justice for All program. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. It just kind of took off. And uh, one Sunday morning, I received a message from Scott Klusendorf, who's uh, one of the most well-known leaders in the pro-life movement and probably one of the best speakers that we have in the movement. And uh, he just uh, sent me this message asking, hey, do you do you work for any sort of pro-life organization? I texted him back. I said, no. And he said, well, would you like to? Uh, you know, He doesn't want to steal anyone away uh, from a pro-life organization. But since I wasn't working for anybody, he offered me a position with LTI. And so that's currently where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Now, when you said a million abortions a year, do you mean just in America? Yeah, yeah, that's just for the United States. So if we went worldwide it would be a much, much higher number. Yeah, it would. Uh, I'm not sure what the statistic is off the top of my head. But yeah, so it would be much higher, of course, because abortion is legal mm -hmm. in uh, many other countries. Mm -hmm. But in the United States alone, uh, it's it, it was at the time over a million. It peaked at about 1.21 million. And then uh, and then it kind of, the, the numbers dwindled a little bit. So it became 1.07 million. And now I've heard that it's it actually below a million now, that the numbers are the lowest since Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little skeptical of that because... Number one, there are at least two states that don't that don't report their abortion numbers because they're not required to. My state of California is one, and California is one of the largest states, and so, so surely uh, there's a significant number of abortions that aren't being re reported in California. But I'm also given to understand that only surgical abortions are reported, that chemical abortions aren't reported, and so considering that there's been a rise in the abortion pill, that also kind of skews the numbers as well. So I'm a little skeptical that abortions are at the lowest they've been since Roe v. Wade. But if they are, that's obviously a, a good thing. But I, like I said, I'm a little skeptical about it. Okay, you all be listening because around the half hour point or so, I'm going to get the literal statement about our next guest and the abortion pill. So if you're interested about the abortion pill, you want to hear who we got next week. But I am also amazed by your story your pastor let you do a presentation at your church that's apologetics related? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and my church wasn't really big on apologetics. I never really learned all of the, you know, I never really learned any of the arguments for God's existence. Uh, in fact, getting out of high school, I actually went through a questioning phase that it, it might have been possible for me to lose my faith because I'd never really been given any sort of of philosophical grounding for my Christian beliefs. And so I wasn't sure if there actually was any good evidence for Christianity. Uh, thankfully, um, I, as I was doing my study, I started to read books by C.S. Lewis and Lee Strobel and uh, some of the well-known apologists. And I started to realize that there actually is very good evidence for Christianity. So I retained my faith, but my church, uh, you know, never really was really interested in apologetics. That's not to say that they actively opposed it because obviously they allowed me to give a a couple of presentations those two years, but it's just to say that it wasn't really a focus that that, that the church really had. So yeah, so it, it wasn't that they were opposed to it, just that it was something that they didn't do. And so yeah, they were they allowed me to to give that presentation. 
What do you think about, about when you hear about abortion going on? And sadly, so many churches seem to say absolutely nothing from a pulpit about it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's disappointing. Um, I, I think it's to be expected, though, because even when we go back to, for example, events like the Holocaust, the church was largely silent during the Holocaust as well. And so it, it, I think it's shameful, but I also think it's to be expected. Mm-hmm. And I also think that if if, uh, if the church and Christians in general had a lot more courage about opposing uh, social evils like abortion or like the Holocaust, I think that a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't get away with it like they do. And so, I, you know, I, you know, there, there's a an organization that I have fundamental disagreements with philosophically and theologically, but uh, but I agree with them when they say that abortion is basically legal at the permission of the church. And I think that there's a lot to that because if the church as a whole decided to stand up and oppose it, we, we you know we could probably end it this month. Hmm, that's uh extremely convicting right there. Now, let's uh, start talking about the book. Now, I'll let people know, unfortunately, I have not got to read the book because I tried to get it through Interlibrary Loan, and because it's a new book, I wasn't able to do that, but I trust Clinton's judgment here. When I was at the National Conference on Christian Apologetics, well, over a, maybe about a decade or so ago, I remember I was living with my roommate at the time, so it was probably around that long, a little bit less, and Chuck Colson came to speak. And at one point, during a main talk that pretty much everyone was supposed to attend, he said, if you say that you're a Christian and you support abortion, you really need to check your faith at the door. And he got a standing ovation to that. And he was very surprised. He says, usually when I say something like that, a lot of Christians get upset with me for saying that. <laughs> you all gave me a standing ovation. What, what do you think when you hear about something like that? Yeah, well, actually, it's funny that you mentioned that because I listened to the Breakpoint podcast, which is hosted by the Colson Fellows. You know, you, had, you have uh, John Stone Street and Ed Stetzer who do their their weekly uh, their weekly commentaries, and then you also have uh, John Stone Street and Eric Metaxas who do like a, a daily sort of commentary on cultural issues. And on one of the recent ones, just a, a couple of days ago, they actually mentioned Chuck Colson at that particular uh, event, saying that. And so. Uh, I, I, I thought it was kind of kind of funny you mentioning that because I actually mentioned that event and that Chuck Colson got that standing ovation and, and usually he, he gets a much much colder reception when he says things like that and so yeah I, you know I, I think I, I hope the people who are at that event uh, you know got inspired to to go out and do good things but yeah I, you know it, it's just it's it's really difficult getting people to. Uh, to, getting people motivated to act, you know, you can, you can tell them, you know, this is the kind of the difficult thing about ethics is that you can you can teach people right from wrong all you want. Merely teaching someone right from wrong is not going to get them motivated to act or to want to be a moral person. So you, you really have to find a way to motivate people to act in such a way that is virtuous, because you know people have a tendency toward laziness and toward apathy, and so you really have to get that motivated. Yeah. I- uh, now, let's uh, get into what we're talking about with a book here. Now, Kira Schlesinger, like I said, she's an Episcopalian priestess, and she's come out with this book, Pro-Choice and Christian. What do you think when you hear someone describe themselves as pro-choice and Christian? Uh, you know, without you know, without wanting to be too uh, too judgmental, but if, if someone tells me that they're pro-choice and Christian, you know, one, one of my first thoughts is, you know, have you ever actually read the Bible? Mm. Um, you know, it, it's it, it's just you know this we 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 you know the word Christian itself uh, indicates that we're followers of Christ, and Jesus in Scripture is portrayed as someone, uh, and you know, I, I, I say. Portrayed, but you know, obviously these are historical accounts of, of Jesus's life and life and ministry. But they really portray Jesus as someone who loves children. You know, um, when the disciples tried to keep the children away from Jesus, he said, "No, no, suffer the little ones to come unto me, because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these." And he said, "If any of you so much as cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for you if you were to tie a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the sea." So Jesus is someone who really loves children, and if we claim to follow Christ, then 
I, I don't see how you can you can consistently claim to follow Christ and to love Jesus if you also think it is permissible to kill an unborn child for uh, for some type of convenience. Either you know you, you don't think you can afford it, or um, or you, you want to continue college, but you think you might have to drop out, or any of these reasons are really just reasons of convenience. And if you think that it's acceptable to kill a child to make your life easier in some way, then I'm not sure you you actually know much much about Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure if she uses the argument in the book, but it could be that it says, you know, there was no chapter and verse, as it were, that specifically condemns abortion. Mm. Yeah, that, that's true, and that's a common argument. And one, and one of the good things about Schlesinger's book, I think, is that she actually does uh, she actually does talk about some of the biblical arguments that Christians use, both for and against. And she she's consistent. She shows that the arguments for abortion used from Scripture are not very conclusive, that abortion is permissible. But she also shows that many of the verses used by Christians against abortion are also not clear cut. And I, I think she does a good job in analyzing those verses and showing that the verses used uh, are, do not necessarily make it an open and shut case. But what I would say about Schlesinger in response, though, is that even though I think she's right about the verses she does engage with, there is a good biblical case to be made against uh, against abortion, and she doesn't interact with that case. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, so it's it's kind of a. Uh, kind of a dual thing there that I think she's right in in showing that these verses do not make it uh, very clear cut, but she does ignore the the I think I think the most compelling scriptural evidence against abortion. Okay, what do you think the most compelling scriptural evidence is then? Yeah, so uh, well, number one, because we have very clear commandments against murdering. It, you know, the Old Testament tells us you shall not murder. It's right there in our Ten Commandments. And she does address that, but she tries to sidestep it by showing, well, there are other types of killing that we find uh, that are not uh, forms of murder, such as self-defense. Uh, and then she talks about um, how abortion is is not something that we find against you know any prescription against in scripture so it's something that that we can disagree on and that kind of thing uh, but the problem with that is that is that the scriptures or she also she also likes to say that uh, that the scriptures are are books of theology about about man's fall uh, and then God coming to earth to redeem mankind and that kind of thing and so uh, and, and so we can't use it to show any sort of prescription for for moral for uh, social issues like abortion, and of course that totally ignores the fact that the book of Leviticus is basically a whole book about laws and about how the Jews were expected to live. And so, even though Jesus did give the Ten Commandments, he said, "You shall not murder." In the Ten Commandments, he uh, he actually talked about certain forms of murder, and he actually. Uh, and in some some of the verses of Leviticus, we actually find that that God does take into account self defense, and that if somebody kills in self defense, there's no moral. Uh, they haven't committed any sort of moral crime, and they can't be punished for it. So I, I think that we can use scripture to show that uh, that we should not be murdering people. And I think that it, since science has shown that that the unborn are human beings from fertilization, then the prescription against murdering also works for the unborn. And we also read in several places in scripture, such as in Jeremiah, that sacrifice of children never even entered God's mind. And that's all abortion is, is just sacrificing a child for in order to make your life easy in some way. And now, of course, there are more difficult situations, and I don't mean to, to push those aside, and I don't mean to, um, to minimize those in any way. I'm just talking about the vast majority of abortions. Because obviously, if we're talking about a situation like rape, or we're talking about a situation where her life is in jeopardy, then that's a much more difficult situation, and it needs to be treated as such. I'm just talking about the vast majority of abortions, which are for socioeconomic reasons reasons. Mm -hmm. And so abortion in the vast majority of cases are just to make the woman's or the couple's life easier in some way. And so I think that abortion definitely is a modern form of child sacrifice, which is uh, condemned in no uncertain terms in scripture and has been shown that it, God has even said that that kind of thing never even entered his mind to command. So I think that we can see quite clearly in Scripture that, uh, that sacrificing children is wrong, uh, to say nothing of the fact that 
uh, th that scripture uses the same Hebrew word in the Old Testament and the same Greek word in the New Testament for child. And so the scriptures make no distinction between a child inside the womb or a child outside the womb. It, it uses the same word for both. And so scripture makes no distinction between the two. And so it seems to me that scripturally, if you kill an unborn child, that's no different than killing a child that's already outside of the womb. And so I think that those are probably the most compelling biblical evidences against abortion. You know, when you talk about abortion being a child sacrifice and such, I've uh, made a statement before that in the past, our ancestors often sacrificed their children, but we could say they were doing it for the good of a harvest or to ensure their families were being or something like that. Still wrong, of course, right. but they were doing it for those reasons. Today, we sacrifice our children at the altar of pure convenience, which I think we're actually worse than they were. Now, yeah. Do, does she deal with any claims about whether what's unborn is human or not? Okay, so yeah, that's that's the thing is that early on in her in her book, she does seem to agree that that a discussion of personhood is important. But the problem is, uh, out of out of the 120 pages in her book, she only spends about three or four addressing that question, um, and, and it's in and, and it's in one of the last chapters of her book. It's in the penultimate chapter, um, which is a chapter called uh, "Reframing Pro Life and Finding Common Ground," and she, she only spends a few pages talking about it. She she says that we're not likely to ever to ever discover when personhood begins, and. Um, and it's actually something she says in that chapter that I that I want to quote from, uh, and I'm I'm looking at that, that up here, um, but yeah, so she she does address it a little bit, and she makes a mistake that that many pro-choice people make, and that's to conflate the question of science of scientific life with with uh, philosophical personhood, and so she'll she'll say, for example, uh, you know that we're not likely to ever know when uh, when personhood begins, uh, and she even makes the claim that that does. Uh, Science can't tell us when life begins, and that, of course, is a scientifically uh, fallacious statement because science has determined when life begins. It it begins at fertilization, uh, but the question of personhood is different. The question of personhood is a philosophical question, not a scientific one. So, conflating the question of when personhood begins with when life begins is just uh, is to obfuscate the issue, basically. <laughs> Well, since you mentioned the whole thing about person, <clears throat> where there is someone who's written a book dealing with this kind of topic recently, and I know you're reading it or have read it, and I'm going to let people know that uh, the author is going to be joining me at the end of the month on the 27th. Uh, we're going to have Nancy Piercy on, talking about her latest book, Love Thy Body, which I've been going through, and it's awesome, and it does deal very well with this. Yes, yeah, excellent book. Uh, I was part of the uh, pre-launch uh, book club that she had, and so I got a chance to read it early. And I, I would hi highly, highly uh, recommend that book as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I've got the the quote here, and okay. th this is something that's it's really, really bizarre reasoning. And this is something that I encounter often is that there are a lot of really bad arguments for abortion and against personhood. And it's, it's kind of difficult for me to understand why someone can't see how bad their reasoning is. And this is just one example of it. So she has just gotten done saying that, you know, no one can tell when personhood begins. Uh, in fact, she talks about um, Katha Pollitt, who's a, a fellow feminist author, and she takes Pollitt's position that we ought to use Joel Feinberg, philosopher Joel Feinberg's view of the common sense person as one who thinks, feels, communicates, uh, and those kinds of things as something who is a person. But she doesn't think that we can ever really know for sure when person begins in the womb. And so she says on page 87 of her book, and I, and I quote, at the same time, we might argue that because we do not know when a person becomes a person, it is best and safest to act as if a fertilized egg is a person to err on the side of life. Because this zygote has the potential to be a human, it should receive special protections in the way that groups of people who have been historically discriminated against based on race, gender, or sexual identity receive special protections. But consider this, if we cannot know for sure, perhaps we should rely instead on a woman whose personhood is not in doubt and her conscience as the one who is most affected, end quote. Now, this is very, very specious reasoning because, number one, 
even if there is disagreement on when personhood begins, that doesn't mean that there's no right answer. Uh, in fact, pro-life people have made a very strong case that personhood begins at fertilization. And since uh, Schlesinger has not has not even attempted to engage with any pro-life thinker on the on the question of personhood, she has not done the job of showing why abortion is justifiable. But then her last sentence, if we can't know for sure, we should rely instead on a woman whose personhood is not in doubt and her conscience as the one who is most affected. But what if someone back in slavery days had made an argument like that? What if someone was arguing, if we can't know whether or not black people are persons, for sure, then perhaps we should rely instead on the plantation owner whose person it is not in doubt and his conscience as the one who is most affected. Mm. That's a very, very specious argument, very poor reasoning. Uh, it, it, and yeah, so it's just that reading that the first time, like I, I had to read it several times because I, I couldn't believe she would make that kind of an argument, but there it is uh, in black and white right there on the page. And I just couldn't understand you know, she, she's basically begging the question by assuming the unborn are not persons while paying lip service to saying that we can't know for sure. But she's already made that assumption because the only way that argument could possibly succeed is if we know for sure that the unborn are persons because we wouldn't accept that sort of reasoning for any other people group. I, I find it amazing constantly how many similarities there are between arguments to justify slavery and arguments to justify abortion. Yeah, there there are definitely a lot of parallels. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, not not least of which is dehumanizing somebody on the basis of an irrelevant characteristic to their value as a human being. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, you have my body, my choice, which is a common pro-choice slogan. And back in the slavery days, you had uh, my plantation, my choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so yeah, you had a lot of the arguments and slogans for slavery are mirrored in arguments and slogans for abortion. And yeah, it's it's kind of a shame that uh, that Schlesinger and her church never got back to you because. You know, uh, obviously, it'd be nice to have her here to to yeah. engage with and and give a defense of, of some of the things she's written. But it really seems to me that I think a lot of pro choice people just are not willing to uh, to justify their own words or defend their own positions in uh, in public forums such as a, a, a yeah. podcast like this. Because I, I run a podcast myself called Pro Life Thinking, uh, which I run through LTI, and I've uh, reached out to some pro choice people. Uh, I, I like I've reached out to uh, a, a professor, Professor Harmon, who uh, got some notoriety in a recent video with uh, with uh, James Franco and another philosopher talking about her argument for abortion. And I, I reached out to her to, to try and have her come onto my podcast, and never heard back from her. And then uh, uh, Christopher Kayser has a book coming out with a with a pro choice thinker uh, where they debate abortion in print. And I reached out to both of them to see if I can get them on the podcast, and I did receive a response from the pro-choice thinker, and she basically said this summer was something she's interested in doing. So it's really, really difficult to get pro-choice people to come on and, and defend their uh, their ideas in a forum like this, unfortunately. If, if anyone's interested, I think it was last year, we did have Christopher Kayser on the show talking about one of his books on pro-life apologetics. So if you're interested in Kayser, go back and listen to that one there. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, I agree with you. It just seems that so many times it, this is a, something that doesn't seem to want to be debated. And I find it incredibly specious that we have we live in a culture that's so scientifically minded and we always want to go for science, for science, for science, except for abortion. And then we turn to the vague philosophy that's usually condemned everywhere else. Right, yeah. A lot of the arguments for abortion, people would never accept in any other in any other discussion, you know, don't like abortion, don't have one. Well, you know, don't like slavery, don't own a slave. You know, it's a it's a bad argument. We never we never accept it anywhere else, but it's seen as acceptable on the abortion issue, and that's uh, yeah. And and you know, it's just my my personal take on it is just that you know they have a lot less to lose by refusing to talk about it because abortion's legal. It's already in the modern mindset. Uh, people already accept abortion as a as necessary for a woman's freedom. So you know they have a lot less to lose by refusing to talk about it than we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, honestly, uh, I also think uh, that uh, the reason that we do this reasoning so much is because. If abortion was not connected with sex, the great God of America, there probably would not be <laughs> right. any interest in it whatsoever, and we'd all re- recognize, yeah, this is wrong. Uh, 
Probably. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. But yeah, like you said, it's it's really tied into sex. And sex is, you know, the, the modern golden calf of the United States. Mm. In fact, uh, my friend Tim Brom from Equal Rights Institute, who I mentioned earlier, actually wrote an article, which I would encourage anyone uh, to go and read on their on their blog, where he actually talks about a, a conversation he had with someone where they talked about well, basically, Tim uh, asked this person if he supports abortion because he believes that there's an unrestricted, uh, inalienable right to have sex. And his response was, yeah. And Tim's uh, intuition, and I share this intuition, is that most people who support abortion support it because they, they have this view that there's an that there's an inalienable, unrestrictable right to have sex. And so uh, preventing women from having abortions restricts people's abilities to have sex. And so, yeah, it's really, really interesting article and it really has some good, uh, some good uh, recommendations on how to address someone who, who has this view and, and how best to engage them in a conversation. It's really worth checking out. Reminded when you're listening to a Deeper Waters podcast, we have a half hour point going only an hour and a half today. We got Clinton Wilcox on talking about the book Pro Choice and Christian that he's responding to by Kira Schlesinger. Now, I said uh, that uh, next time on the show we'll be talking to some about the abortion pill. But next time on the show, we're going to have Aaron Delgado on, and he's a doctor who's invented a pill that can reverse the abortion pill. As it were, and as you can imagine, the uh, pro-choice community is happy to see that someone's advocating for for choice. Have you suddenly decide you want to have a kid after all? You can have it. No, no, they're not. They're pretty upset with him for some strange reason. Uh, yeah. He'll be here to talk about that pair here. Now, when we talk about this, we refer to sex as the golden calf of America and such things like that. And there are some people out there who are sure I'm going to be saying or thing. Well, there you have it. Pro-life people are anti-sex. They just want to control our sex lives. Yeah, uh, and that's that's especially common amongst feminists. And Kira Schlesinger is a uh, self-proclaimed feminist. And in fact, like I said, her book barely, barely even touches on the question of personhood. Her book largely reads just like any standard uh, feminist book supporting abortion. I, you know, I've read Katha Pollitt's book. Um, I've read Willie Parker's book who is a doctor and even as a doctor and a, a scientist, he still spends very, very little time talking about the, the person. Uh, so he, he talks a lot about women and women's equality and things like that. And so that's just kind of kind of what you do if you're pro-choice, you know, they, they can't win on the scientific or philosophical question. Uh, you know, obviously there are, there are really smart, pro-choice people who can make a much better case, such as David Boonin or Michael Tooley or Peter Singer. But these these uh, feminists, um, you know, they don't study the, the best arguments. They have arguments which are, which if a philosopher was reading it, would be dismissed as question-begging. Um, for instance, the thesis of Schlesinger's book is really that uh, in a perfect world, there would be no need for abortion, uh, you know, because everyone would treat everyone with respect that, um, uh, you know, actually, yeah. Let me let me let me find that real quick because early on she talks about that, and I kind of consider that to be the thesis of her of her book. Um, let me see. Okay, so yeah, so here on page uh, page ten uh, of the book, she she writes, "quote Every pregnancy, every situation is unique because it involves people, and people are complicated individuals with their own joys, griefs, and relationships. Sometimes people do horrible things to one another, as in the cases of rape and incest. Sometimes a woman's age or medical conditions make pregnancies difficult or dangerous. Sometimes contra 
contraception doesn't work the way it is supposed to. A woman accidentally skips a pill, a condom breaks, a vasectomy fails. Sometimes a family already has more children than they can support financially and emotionally. Conception and pregnancy are not always welcomed with joy and gratitude, even for a married couple, end quote. And so the thesis of her book, her, her main argument is basically a standard feminist argument from people like Katha Pollitt and others, is that, uh, is that regardless of whether or not the unborn is a person, women need abortion, number one, to become equal with men because men have all these opportunities and they don't have to worry about pregnancy. But the thesis of Schlesinger's book is that women also need abortion because we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world where people where people rape each other or contraception fails or doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Because we don't live in this perfect world, um, if we're going to exhibit Christian love, we need to walk beside these women and not oppose them in, during these these difficult decisions. And so she, and, and she also pays lip service to the unborn as well. Because even though she talks about how we really can't know for sure, she talks about being pro-life needs to broaden its scope in that we need to not just consider the unborn to be persons, we also need to consider the women to be persons. And while of course a pro-life person would would agree with that, and we do consider women to be persons. The problem is she's just paying lip service because even though she says we also need to think of women as persons, um, she's obviously supporting a woman's abortion decision, meaning that she's she's not considering the unborn to be persons in her more broad pro-life umbrella, basically. So mm -hmm. it's really just lip service that she's paying to want to see both treated as persons. <laughs> And the thing is, things she said about being not being in a perfect war, about, you know, sometimes bad things happen to women. Women do want to try and get ahead as much as they can. Sometimes contraceptions and such fail. None of us, I think, would have a hard time agree disagreeing with that. Mm. Right. Yeah, and that, that's why I would say as a pro-life person, and I know you would agree and, and mm -hmm. you know, Probably every pro-life person would agree that we need to we need to make sure men are stepping up because we don't believe that you know feminists like Schlesinger and Willie Parker would say that pro-life people don't care about the women at all or don't care about the child after birth. But the fact is that we do, and we we the fact that we do care about these women means that we also believe that men need to step up and take responsibility for their actions. And taking responsibility does not mean killing the unborn child. It means realizing that you have conceived a child and. Mm -hmm. uh, and take responsibility for for yeah. raising that child. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so we would believe that the man bears responsibility just like the woman does. And isn't the case that actually, if we compare the number of Planned Parenthoods in America to the number of pro life organizations to take care of children in America, the pro life organizations outnumber the Planned Parenthoods. Yeah, uh, the figure I've heard is that uh, is that. Uh, pregnancy care centers outnumber Planned Parenthood's three to one, and the, and the thing is that it's it's such a bizarre claim. You know, there have been a website. I think the Federalist printed a, an article about this, that saying pro life people don't care about children is just a lazy slander. Uh, it it shows an inability to think critically on the part of many pro choice people, mm -hmm. because number one, Planned Parenthood doesn't care about your child. Uh, if you decide to keep a child, they're not going to to help you raise it. They're not going to give you any support. In fact, often what they'll do is they'll actually refer you to a pregnancy care center. And so pro-life people have started pregnancy care centers because, yeah, we oppose abortion and we're not going to give you an abortion if you want it, but we do have resources and we will help you if you decide to keep your child. Mm -hmm. And so it's really not just a lazy slander. It's also, ju it's also just completely bogus. And, and it's just a, you know, it, it's just a way to, to distract the issue from, from the, the fact that the unborn is a whole living individual human person to trying to claim that pro-life people are just really lousy people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, we still haven't heard anything really that I think is a specific refutation of the idea that pro-lifers are still just really anti-sex people trying to control everyone's sex lives, and we just want to see all the women in America barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen again fixing us sandwiches. Right. Yeah, that's actually a point that uh, Schlesinger makes in her book, too, is that Christianity for a long time has... Uh, uh, I, I forget the exact word she uses. That we, um, that we basically, well, we stigmatize sex, which isn't true. Uh, you know, obviously Christians believe that there is an ethic behind sex. That uh, sex is only to be had between a married man and woman. Mm -hmm. um, 
by so so we don't stigmatize sex. Uh, there there might be a sense in which we stigmatize sex before marriage or sex outside the marital bonds, but that's only because it's wrong behavior. And even even when there's no uh, shame or condemning going on, a person's conscience will condemn them. And so it, it may seem like the Christian church is condemning them for it, but that's probably just their own conscience. I mean, I, I once was involved in a youth group, which was probably the least judgmental youth group I've ever seen. And still uh, a girl got pregnant and stopped coming because she didn't want everyone there to judge her when it's like, you know, everyone there was friends and no one would have judged anyone, but she still felt convicted because she'd had uh, sex when she wasn't married got pregnant and uh, yeah so it's just you know a lot of a lot of times I think it's really just they're responding to their conscience and not they're not responding to anything really that the church does itself mm -hmm. and so yeah so you know Christians uh, do not hate sex in fact we love sex in fact one of the uh, one of the first or in fact the first commandment that God gave Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply so obviously sex is a good thing but just like with other uh, with other bodily things like uh, eating, for example, um, there is a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. And if you abuse it, it's going to it's going to be detrimental. It's not just that it's immoral, but you have things like sexually transmitted diseases to worry about. You have things like unplanned pregnancies to worry about. Uh, you know, and you know, sex is not just a recreational activity, but mm -hmm. uh, when you, when a couple has sex, there are um, endorphins and, and chemicals that are released in their in their brains that bond them together. And so, and so it's not just that it's wrong, it's not just that you risk diseases or pregnancy, but it's that uh, it's that there's 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 also a sense in which it can lead to heartbreak because you're you're only treating it recreationally when in fact your bodies are are basically telling you that this is the person that that you want to commit your life to because he or she is the person that you're having sex with. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of, of reasons why, not, not just from a biblical perspective, but there, are, but there are pragmatic reasons that you would want to avoid having sex with someone that you're not married with mm -hmm. or married to. Yeah, and uh, one of my favorite quotes, sure, this is the way many people think, I'm sure you remember when Texas had a bill being passed to uh, limit abortions and such, or maybe set for stage you could have abortions back further. There was a guy named Ben Sherman, I think you already know where I'm going, who listed four reasons why men should uh, should oppose this measure. And he said, and this is what he said, men, your sex life is at stake. Can you think of anything <laughs> that cures a vibe faster than a woman feeling a back alley abortion? Making abortion essentially inaccessible in Texas will add an anxiety to sex that will drastically undercut its stories. And don't be surprised if casual sex outside relationships becomes far more difficult to come by. Yeah, uh, I didn't recognize the name. But when you started listing off those reasons, I recognized that because I did read uh, that article. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so my, my first, you know, my first thought is, so what? <laughs> yeah, you know, because you're not supposed to be having uh, sex outside of marriage anyway. So, you know that that anxiety is a good thing because you know that that's the you know well obviously excessive anxiety is bad. Uh, I myself am a person who struggles with yeah uh, with anxiety and depression and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, but anxiety, uh, normal anxiety is good, you know, and fear is good because it keeps us from doing things that we shouldn't be doing. You know, fear of getting struck by a vehicle keeps me from going out and playing in the street. So that anxiety of realizing, you know, if, you know, what if, you know, what if I get a girl pregnant? I can't afford to raise a child. That kind of anxiety uh, is a good thing because it, it'll help us, even if we're not reasoning very well, mm -hmm. it'll help us still make uh, better decisions than we would if, if we just, you know, through caution of the wind, and didn't worry about about that kind of thing. Yeah, I uh, went on the blog when that happened because uh, he had it open for comments, and he since taken most comments down, I believe. But uh, I just have been posting and let him know that I essentially see him as just a child, a boy. It's like, and let me let you in on a little secret: if you want to be in a place where you can have good, regular sex with someone and have it be very enjoyable. It's just real secret. Get married. It right. works very well. You get to have a great partner for the rest of your life. Hmm. Yeah, and you know, studies are studies have even shown that married couples have more fulfilling sex lives than yeah. uh, than single people do who sleep mm -hmm. around. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think it was even a study done in Red Book, which, as we know, Red Book is a bastion of conservative evangelical thinking, and. Uh, Apparently, the, pe the women who 
report back having the most fulfilled sex lives were evangelical Protestants. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so so there are great benefits to getting married, not least of which is is a more fulfilling sex life. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously there are other benefits, but yeah, if if having good, meaningful sex is is that important to you, then getting married is what you need to do because you know you won't have the anxiety of of having to give yourself to a different person every time you you go out, but you'll have someone mm-hmm. that you're building a life with and building a, a good, meaningful, lasting relationship with. Yeah, I like to let people know that we have several shows that we've done here on the topic of marriage. Uh, shows to help build up marriage. We've had uh, we've had the Yorkovich is on, Marlon and Kay Yorkovich to map their book about how to love me how to love and such, how we love. Um Les and Jan Greeby, some people from a church I used to go to who have been married for fifty plus years. And we've had people talking about saving sex for marriage, such as Glenn Stanton on his book uh, on why marriage matters, and Brian Adams coming on with his book, Everybody Loves Sex, So Why Wait? So if you want some more information on this, just look through our archives. I'm sure you'll find something. Uh, and, that's, not, uh, that's not the Brian Adams who wrote Summer of 69, is it? I, I don't think it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. Can I like to go back to something you said earlier? You said that we know life begins at conception. Now, is this just, you know, conservative Christian bioethics people and such who are saying this? Or is this is this a debated position or what? No, it's it's not debated. Uh, in fact, it's it's attested to by every embryologist since the since the late or since the mid to late eighteen hundreds. Uh, in fact, Alan Guttmacher, in a book he wrote in the nineteen thirties, uh, nineteen thirty three, I believe, um, he wrote that today we know that man is born from the sperm and the egg in the body of a woman. And this all seems so simple and evident that it's difficult to picture a time when it wasn't part of the common knowledge. So when life begins has been settled since the mid to late 1800s. It's not a question that's debated. In fact, to go back to something that you said earlier, uh, Nick, we talked about um, about some settled questions and and you know, we'll have atheists tell us all day long that science has settled the question on evolution. That evolution happened. If you disagree, you're either evil or stupid or both. And then they'll look at at, at the abortion issue and say, "Oh, you know, science has been wrong before. You know, there's no real consensus on when life begins. When in fact, there is scientific consensus on when life begins. Uh, and so, you know, they'll accept. You know, they believe there's scientific consensus on evolution, but then they look at the scientific consensus on on uh, on when life begins and they'll try to wave it away." And, and, and again, uh, I, I shouldn't say uh, atheists in general because there are atheists who support the pro-life position. Oh, I'm yes. just saying in general, uh, you know, pro-choice atheists will often say this. Uh, and I'm sure pro-choice Christians probably do too. Um, but uh, they, although I haven't really read them in regards to the uh, evolution issue, whether or not they're pro-choice. But definitely uh, pro-choice naturalists will say that the, the question of evolution has been settled by science, and then they'll look at, at the abortion issue and say, well, you know, science has been wrong before, and, you know, it's an always changing discipline and things like that. So, yeah, so they really want to hedge their bets when it comes to the abortion issue. But the reality is that uh, there's scientific consensus on when life begins. And so when, when you hear someone say there's no scientific consensus, or sometimes you'll even hear a scientist say that, um, I, I wrote an article responding to a biologist who's become popular on the internet named P.Z. Myers. I'm sure you've heard the name, Nick. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Yeah. And he said, you know, he went to a, a debate between Christine Kruselnicki of uh, pro, pro-life humanists uh, and uh, Matt Dillahunty. And he basically tried to claim that there's no scientific consensus on when life begins. And the problem is, is that number one, he's not an expert. He's a biologist. When the expert on embryos are embryologists, it's a different field. But when you hear a scientist say that there's no scientific consensus on when life begins, what they're actually doing is they're conflating philosophy and science. They're making a philosophical claim that no one knows when personhood begins and dressing it up in scientific language, that no one knows when life begins. Hmm. It's just not true that there's no scientific consensus 
happens is that when life begins. It's that fertilization. No scientist worth his weight in gold-pressed latinum will deny that simple biological fact. But there is no scientific consensus on when personhood begins, and that's true because personhood is not a scientific question. It's a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. So the fact that scientists disagree on whether or not the unborn are persons shouldn't bother anybody because they're, they're not experts on it. It'd be like, uh, you know, going to your Catholic priest and, and using him as an authority on, on whether or not evolution happened. He may be knowledgeable on the issue, but to, to get the cold hard facts, you'd really want to go to a biologist because they're the ones who are the experts yeah. in the field. Now, I'd like to read you a quote, in fact, from an atheist who was interviewed. And one of the questions he was asked about, it was a political interview, was abortion. He said, as for abortion, it is a crime against humanity. How can anyone claim the name humanist and be pro-abortion? Beats me. I'd love to see Roe v. Wade repealed. Evidence-based policy is the last thing progressives really want. Hmm. And that was actually Robert Price, who can be very far out on the fringe being a Jesus mythicist and such, but this hmm. was when David McAfee interviewed him on why he's on the Trump train, as it were. Oh, so that was oh, that was Robert Price? Yep. Okay, I thought that was uh, okay. I thought you were going to say that was Peter Hitchens because uh, Hitchens also uh, was pro life. Um, you mean Christopher Hitchens or Christopher Hitchens? Yeah, yeah. yeah Peter is his brother. That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Christopher Hitchens uh, mm -hmm. was also pro life as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's always great to encounter uh, you know pro life atheists. Uh, Nat uh, Nat Hintoff is another uh, famous atheist who is also pro life. He was a journalist mm -hmm. uh, who passed away, I think, a few years ago. So yeah. yeah. Since I mentioned. Price and the Trump train there. Something that gets me thinking about this whole issue also is that uh, back in the 2016 election, in the third debate, you know, Trump caused a controversy when he was asked about, will you accept the results of the election if you lose? And he said, I'll wait and see. Which I didn't have any problem with that answer. But, yeah. it, but everyone went ballistic. Meanwhile, live on stage, Hillary Clinton defended partial birth abortion, even describing the procedure, and no one said a thing about that. Right. Yeah, well, again, you know, abortion is a is a sacred cow here in the United States, and so, uh, you know, you'll 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 have pro choice people who will try and tell you that no one supports late term abortion. You know, the the only, the only women getting late term abortions are women who uh, whose life is in jeopardy and they need to to have an abortion, which of course is a specious claim because mm -hmm. if a woman is is in the late term and, and needs an abortion to save her life, the, the doctors aren't going to give her an abortion; they're going to give her a C section and deliver the child, which is faster mm -hmm. and safer for her in the late term. Uh, so late term abortions do happen and they do happen for frivolous reasons. Um, but yeah, and so the, the fact that Hillary Clinton defended partial birth abortion uh, wouldn't phase pro-choice people because while they'll say um, that you know no one actually defends late term abortions, the fact that people do, you know, doesn't... I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if there if there's just that that like in the back of their head they know that's not true that people don't defend it or what. But yeah, it doesn't seem to to be an issue. Uh, you know, and you'll have pro choice people who will actually. In fact, uh, Kara Schlesinger actually in her book talks about uh, basically decried that pro life people opposed late term abortion and got it illegal. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it, it's a really barbaric procedure, and it, they'll they'll take issue with the name partial birth abortion because it's really a DNX dilation and extraction. Mm -hmm. That's the clinical term for it. But the reason that pro life people call it partial birth abortion is because it takes the it takes the clinical spin off of it because you are partially birthing. In fact, you're you're actually mostly birthing the child in order to kill it. Uh, I don't know if I should go into detail because it's pretty gruesome and you might have sensitive listeners. But okay. you, you, basic, um, listeners, you, you basically basically deliver. Listeners have, listeners have there. If you've got children and such, this might be a good time to turn things down or such, or wait till later. And if you're extremely squeamish, you might want to fast forward a little bit here. So go ahead, yeah. Tim. Yeah, it should just take about 15 seconds. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I guess you want me to describe it. Yeah, basically, a DNX, dilation and extraction, or partial birth abortion, as pro-life people call it, you, uh, you dilate the cervix um, so that you can actually deliver the child partially. You, 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 t you grab its foot with forceps and you pull it 
mostly out of the birth canal until just the head is, uh, remains inside the birth canal. And then you take a pair of scissors and put it in the back of the neck of the child, and then you split it open, and you put, you put in a suction device, and you suck the brain out, which will collapse the skull, and then you deliver the child most, uh, the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. And so it's a it's a very very barbaric procedure. The fact that anyone would defend such a thing, uh, even even if you just want to defend abortion generally, really kind of disgusts me. And uh, and the reason that pro life people call it partial birth abortion is because yeah, that's not the official name, but that's that's basically what it is. You're it, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how how large a, a baby's head is, but it, it's basically just a few inches away from infanticide because just the head remains inside the birth canal. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, so someone like Donald Trump, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, <laughs> Donald Trump's kind of a weird case. Like, I don't know like how how serious he is on his uh, opposition to abortion, but you can actually find a video of a politician on YouTube uh, oh, I'm I'm blanking on his name. His last name starts with S, but he's a Republican politician, and he basically Santorum. goes up against. Uh, yeah, Santorum. That's that's the one. Uh, Santorum, who who really really impressed me because uh, most politicians I don't think are as eloquent as he is against abortion, but he goes up against a pro-choice senator. I want to say. It's Diane Feinstein, but it might be Barbara Boxer. It was Barbara Boxer, I think. Barbara Boxer, okay, yeah. And so he basically just uh, he just basically lets her have it. Like, you know, okay, so in a partial birth abortion, just a head, just the head remains inside the birth canal. Um, so what if it's just like the foot, or what if it's just like a toe that remains inside the birth canal? Is this is should it still be permissible to kill the fetus then? And yeah, you have. To go to some some pretty absurd lengths to to really defend uh, partial birth abortion, you know, not just abortion in general, but partial birth abortion specifically. And so, yeah, it's it's really a barbaric procedure. And the fact that pro-choice people still defend it, uh, even though they claim it's a very rare procedure, but they still defend it, um, it's just really, yeah, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I, I actually did go through and read Hillary's latest book, Got Up for Library, What Happened. That one, it, it, I didn't have to use any library loan for it, so I was able to get for me. And I came across two quotes on the same page in that, that made me think about what she said in that debate. And as soon as I read these, I thought, you better hope these aren't true, actually. When was every child deserves a chance to live up to his or her God-given potential? Mm. And then that same paragraph says, I continue to believe that a society should be judged by how we treat the most vulnerable among us, especially children. You mm. better hope that's not true. <laughs> yeah, uh, Hillary Clinton is just one person who's who's tone deaf. Mm. Uh, you know, whoever whoever runs Planned Parenthood's Twitter account is also pretty tone deaf. But yeah, every child deserves to to give, be given the chance to live up to their God given potential. Yet she she's like hardcore pro choice. Mm-hmm. Well. Yeah. So, what about the children in the womb who who have barely had a chance to live up to their God given potential? I mean, they're still working on the potential to uh, to get to the point where they can uh, where they can breathe oxygen and survive outside the womb. And yet, you're taking that away before they even have a chance to to live up to their potential. And it's just. Yeah, and she's just a tone deaf politician. Mm-hmm. She wants to, you know, she wants everyone to think that she's she's great. But you know, obviously, if you if you have if you have true and accurate views as far as what the unborn from fertilization are, then you realize that she's just speaking out both sides of her mouth. Mm-hmm. Now, what would we say about? Because I'm sure Schlesinger would say this about. There are cases that a woman does get pregnant through something like, say, rape or incest. And you and I know we should have the utmost sympathy for that, but doesn't it seem cruel to have a woman live with that reminder for so long? Yeah, the problem with, with that with that argument, though, is that nothing is going to remove the reminder of the rape. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she... If... If she decides to go through with it, then she could always uh, gift the child to a loving family for adoption. And so she can not live with the reminder and not kill the child as well. And now when we talk about rape, obviously we need to be very sensitive about this because it is a very difficult situation. And we don't want to come off as as callous or unfeeling when we talk about this issue. And so we want to make sure we want to make sure it's known that we have the utmost sympathy 
for a woman who's been raped. Mm -hmm. But the sympathy that we have for her situation doesn't then justify just any sort of act. You know, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't, for example, justify vigilante justice. Like if if my sister is raped, that does not justify me going out and then torturing. If I find the rapist, torturing him and killing him, I'm not justified in doing that because I have to let the law handle it. Uh, I, that would be vigilante justice and it would not be permissible for me to do that. So just because someone that you care about is raped doesn't then justify any act that the rape victim would then do. And so and so, what we're trying to say as pro-life people is that this is a valuable human being that's been conceived through through very difficult and, uh, and evil act. But uh, the, the fact of his or her conception then doesn't justify uh, killing the child. And so even uh, even a pro-choice abortionist like uh, Warren Hearn, who's written probably the most widely read book uh, on abortion practice, in fact, I think the book's actually called Abortion Practice, he actually says that, um, or he implies that, a, that an abortion might not even be the best thing for a woman that's raped. He says in his book that a woman who's been raped should be referred to for proper counseling. She won't find that proper counseling in the abortionist's office. Mm -hmm. so, it's, it, so it seems like the loving thing to do is, uh, is not to let her go through with the abortion, but should be to give her all the love and care and support that we can give her because we need to, to help her, but we need to do so in a way that's ethically prescribed. I, I like what you uh, said about uh, comparing it to vigilante justice, because the reality is, I mean, for instance, if I found out someone had seriously, seriously hurt Allie, I would be really making a good consideration for vigilante justice at that point. And I think a lot of people would say, even if the action wasn't a problem, say we can sure understand the desire and the intention behind the action. There could be a lot of nobility right. to that. But the desire and the intention itself doesn't mean the act is automatically right. Now, of course, if we're right. walking down the street and someone attacks both of us and we're going after her, all of a sudden that changes because I have to give a defense at that point. But I, mean, right. I that, that's a good, it's, I think that's a, a key distinction to make. Yeah, so obviously if the act is happening in real time, then you have a right to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. But after the fact, the, the deed has already been done, you're, you're no longer justified in, uh, in, in causing harm to the rapist. You, you have to let the law uh, handle it because the law is the one that's, uh, that, that has the proper justification for punishing evildoers. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so you can take extreme measures to protect yourself. You can, uh, you know, in, in fact, the law even forbids killing somebody unless the, unless the threat to your life is imminent. Mm -hmm. So even the law recognizes that there are certain things that we can do and certain things that we can't do, uh, even when it comes to defending ourselves. If someone takes a swing at me with his fist, I am not justified in pulling out my gun and shooting him, even though I'm trying to get out of the situation and I'm trying to prevent harm to myself. I can't shoot him with a gun just because he's swinging his fist at me. So mm -hmm. our law even recognizes that there are some things we can do and some things we can't do when it comes to defending ourselves and um, protecting ourselves and others. I'd like to remind everyone at this point, you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast, and everything we do here, it's supported by listeners like you. And we're starting a brand new year here. We'd really like to get your support and such. And if you're willing to do that, please go to deeperwatersapologetics.com. And uh, you can see the link, help support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. And... If you click on that sublink in there, you get taken to the Ministry of Risen Jesus. That's the ministry of my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona. You make a donation there, then you get in touch with me or Ali or Mike or Debbie and say, Hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. We get that donation. It is tax deductible. And uh, if you want to also, you can go on Amazon, buy ebooks that I've written, such as A Creed for the Ages, The Apostles' Creed and Today's Christian or co-written such as 
Defining inerrancy, God and natural disasters, um, Christian answers for this generation's questions, groundness. And if you want another way you can support us, I mean, as we were talking about for women in our lives a while ago, I'm not sure if you men have noticed this, but women tend to like jewelry. Yeah, it just seems to touch their hearts in a special way. And might I remind you guys, we have Valentine's Day coming up. This could be a good time to get your hands on some jewelry for that lady in your life. You just go to our store that we've got online, the jewelry store we have, and you make your purchase and you get in touch with me and let me know about it. Whatever you purchase for that lady in your life, 25% of it will go to deeper waters. So, guys, like that's you know, like I always tell you, you can buy something for that lady in your life to make up for that big screw up that you recently did with her, or you can buy some that lady in your life to make up that big screw up that I know you're going to make with her. So now, Clinton, do you have? Oh, and also before I even get there, if uh, you can't do any of these, please go on iTunes and leave a positive review for Deeper Waters podcast. I love to see them. So, Clinton, do you have any organization or charity you'd like to see people donate to? Um, well, sure. Yeah, like I said, I work for Life Training Institute, and uh, and actually, um, I could I could put a plug in there for for myself real quick because sure. uh, I I am a full time pro life advocate, and I subsist off of donations from financial supporters, and so uh, and so if you can get in contact with me, and I could talk to you personally about what it is I do in the pro life movement. But uh, just in a nutshell, uh, you know, I, I I host a podcast myself, which is an educational podcast. Um, I write for several blogs. Uh, I, I write educational content, um, and I have some other projects that I'm working on for the future as well. Well, and, and so my uh, my niche in the pro life movement is education, and so uh, I, I read widely, and so uh, you know a lot of uh, the money that I that I make goes towards books, which help toward my own education, so that I can um, so that I can you know learn more about what people are arguing and and be able to to teach it and that kind of thing. And so uh, and so that's kind of kind of my niche in the movement is that uh, I teach people and I train people how to make the pro life. A case more effectively and more persuasively, and so if that's a cause that you'd like to to donate toward, uh, so you can help me keep the you know uh, keep the lights on and, and help me pay my bills and pay for for materials and, and you know just basic uh, incidental so that I can uh, so that I can live while I uh, while I work in the movement, then you can go to the Life Training Institute website, which is at prolifetraining.com, and then you can click on donate. There, there's a link to it up on the top. Uh, and so, when when you get to the new the donate page, uh, you know just fill out the information and then make sure to put my name in the con- in the notes section so that Life Training Institute knows to put your donation into my account. I have an account within there, and uh, because they are a f- a nonprofit, uh, yeah. the Five donations three. right, yeah, the, the donations through them are are tax deductible as well. Mm. So yeah, so uh, so yeah, that's what I would encourage because uh, I, I think that the work that I do is, is uh, is important, and if you'd like to see that, uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, um, you know, because a lot of people don't have the time uh, or resources to 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 do the reading or, or the kind of things um, that that I do, and so this, and, and so if you don't have that kind of time, if you're raising a family or you're in school, you just don't have the time to to help learn about about this and and do the the amount of of talking to people that I do well you can really help be a part of that by uh, by helping to donate toward that and your financial resources will be greatly appreciated and it will go toward um, toward helping uh, pro life people make the the pro life case so that's I, th- I think uh, donating to any organization is a great way to to help um, if if you don't have the time to do it yourself so mm-hmm. yeah I remember the old saying that money cannot buy happiness but it can buy books, which is kind of the same thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, and if money can't buy happiness, uh, if money can't buy happiness, I guess I'm just gonna have to rent it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about something you said earlier today about uh, how the church doesn't seem to really want to say anything about the issue. As a matter of fact, church doesn't really usually want to say anything about social or political issues whatsoever. And there just doesn't seem to be any motivation. Such. What do you think we can do about this? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, f- well, for one thing, a, a lot of pro-life people like myself and others that I work that I work with are doing is just trying to get into churches to give these presentations. We can go and talk to the pastor, and there's usually a way that you have to do it um, that. You know, because pastors have a few things, a few concerns that they have to keep in mind. And that's one of the reasons why they don't ordinarily talk about this issue, such as, you know, they're afraid that they might have post abortive women in their congregations and they might mm-hmm. upset one of them if they talk about abortion. Or, you know, there might be a financial aspect to it that it, if they offend somebody, they might stop coming to church and then they'll lose that tithe. And so there are certain things which, uh, which pastors are worried about and have to keep in mind as they're trying to decide whether or not to have a pro life speaker. And so one of the things that we can do is to talk to the pastor directly and let him know that the presentation that we give is not offensive and we do our best to to make it accessible to everybody. And if we do show pictures, you know, we always give a warning beforehand or if they request not to show pictures, then I'm like, yeah, then uh, then we usually don't, I think. Or I, I think, uh, yeah, because we, we usually prefer to show pictures. And so it's usually up to the discretion of the, of the pro-life person whether they want to go on without showing pictures or not. Um, but, yeah, but because, you know, pictures have been shown to really be an excellent motivator. So it, it kind of hinders a presentation not to be able to show them. But uh, so basically, you know, approaching a pastor, showing that there is a way that we can discuss the issue with the minimum of potential for offense, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's one way that we can do it is just to try and get our foot in the door to give presentations at churches that way. Um, as far as getting the, the church at large motivated to do it, I am. I'm just really not sure because, like I said, it seems like with every with every social social uh, or human rights abuse, such as with the Holocaust, it seems like the church at large hasn't really gotten themselves involved. And so, I, I'm not really sure there is a way that we can uh, that we can get the whole church involved, especially since there is a fairly sizable number that consider themselves to be pro-choice. And they're and in fact, we uh, just uh, last uh, last or a couple of years ago in 2016, I believe, there was an article printed, published by Life News, I think it was, mm-hmm. talking about how there were four or five pastors in Washington, D.C. who actually uh, gave their blessing to Planned Parenthood and prayed over the opening of a new Planned Parenthood clinic. So we, we don't just have the pro-choice mindset to overcome. We also have pro-choice Christians to overcome. And this is something that's sadly very universal in the church, I mean, we don't even teach about serious doctrinal issues in Christianity. Too often, I think Christian sermons are about, here's how you be a good person, and here's how you go to heaven when you die, and that's it. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, they talk about sin because sin is important. And, you know, there's nothing specifically wrong with that. But, yeah, that, that's that's one of the issues that I've encountered, especially in that Southern Baptist church that I grew up in, is just that they don't interact with the mind very often. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they've, they've got theology. You know, they talk about sin. They talk about repentance, which are important things. But, uh, you know, like I said, when I got out of high school, I went through a questioning phase just because I didn't know if there was really any evidence for it. Uh, I'm thankful now. I'm at, a, I'm at a Lutheran church, and I really enjoy the pastor that I have because he talks a lot about the history and, uh, and the theology and the church history and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm really pleased with the pastor I have now. Um, and he's not really involved in the pro-life movement, but he's generally been pretty uh, pretty supportive of my pro-life work. So uh, so yeah, and, and even though I think the, the Lutheran synod that I'm a part of, I think it's the more liberal one. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I'm hoping to be able to, to change that sometime. But yeah, so I'm really pleased uh, with, with the the church I'm at now, as as far as uh, having more uh, intellectual substance to the sermons. Now, if you were talking to another Christian individually, what would you tell them about abortion in the hopes that it would motivate them? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, if I was trying to motivate a Christian, are we talking about someone who already knows life begins at fertilization or someone who doesn't really even know the, the facts? Let's assume someone who doesn't know a fax even. Okay, so the first thing I would probably do is, uh, well, if I encounter someone, especially like if I'm out on a college campus, I might ask them if they if they support abortion, and if they tell me that they don't, uh, I'll, I'll ask them a few clarification questions. You know, do you support uh, or do you, do you oppose abortion through all nine months of pregnancy? Are there any situations when you think it might be uh, it might be uh, um, well, it might be a, a viable 
alternative for a woman to take, questions like that, just to make sure we're really on the same page there. And then I would probably ask them why they're why they consider themselves pro-life. And probably one of the most common responses I get when I ask that question is that it's because they're a Christian or their pastor is pro-life and uh, you know those kinds of things. And so it, for that person, I might ask them, would it be helpful to you if I take you through the science, the science of human development? Because I, I think that, that uh, knowing the science of human development will make it a lot more uh, will we'll, we'll basically give us a lot better of a grounding on which to explain to people why we're why we're pro life, and then assuming that they that they're okay with that, then I'll, I'll basically just take them through the scientific evidence that human life begins at fertilization, um, and then once I've gone through that, then uh, then hopefully they'll start to see why we're out there talking about it on their own. But uh, you know, just knowing the facts alone doesn't necessarily motivate someone into action, right. because I, I've actually noticed that a lot of people. Uh, have a hard time thinking abstractly. And so the reason why so many people are pro-choice and the reason why so many pro-life people or people who consider themselves pro-life don't take action is just, it seems to me, it's just because it's done behind closed doors. And, you know, the, the unborn organism is in the womb. You can't really see it. And so it's not really something that's that's in their face. And so it seems like it's a lot, lot easier to justify it just on those grounds or to justify why, um, why they shouldn't be speaking out about it. And so... And so, in order to motivate someone, you know, they really need to understand the facts of of human embryology. But it also seems to me that they need to to understand the moral reasoning of the pro life position. That it's it's not just that it's a human being, but we see it as equivalent to um, to someone killing an infant or an, or a toddler. And so, if uh, if you see someone who's about to to kill a toddler, like if if your if you knew your friend was tired of being a parent and you knew that he was about to kill his toddler, well, you'd step in and say something, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. Well, the the thing about the pro, about pro life people is that we see that unborn organism as exactly the same morally speaking. Obviously, there are a lot of differences in size, level of development, degree of dependency, etc. But morally speaking, as far as being a person is concerned, we see that unborn organism as just as valuable as that toddler. And so if we know that someone is going to try and have her unborn child killed, then we think we have an obligation to step in, you know, not not violently, but we think that we have an obligation to step in and at least try to do something, try to talk her out of it. And and on a more global scale, if we knew that our government was killing toddlers en masse, uh, we would stand up and say, no, that's wrong. We need to stop this. And so since we see, since pro-life people see the unborn as morally on par with with newborns and toddlers, uh, we think that we have an obligation then to petition our government to stop killing them. You know, there was something going around on the internet maybe a couple of months or so ago with someone who said, I've never had a pro-life or answer this argument whatsoever, and I think every single pro-life on the planet has, but I'd like to ask it to you just oh. in case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, you probably know which objection I'm giving. And it's about, yeah. imagine you're in a lab and a fire breaks out, and you have a chance to save, say, your human associates you're working with who are staying right with you, or a hundred frozen embryos. And everyone seems to say, we're getting the other people out. And he says, well, see, there you have it. You don't think the embryos refer to uh, human lives. Hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. The person you're, you're talking about is a, is a sci-fi author named Patrick S. Tomlinson, mm-hmm. and his, the thought experiment he brings up is is neither new nor is it novel, but uh, he presents it as if it is, and he says that no pro-life person has ever given him an honest answer. And the funny thing about that is that a lot of pro-life people on Twitter were giving him honest answers, and he ended up blocking most of them. Mm-hmm. So. You know, my, my my suspicion is that he's not really interested in an honest answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I'd never heard of him before this, but I was at a Barnes and Noble recently, uh, looking through the science fiction novel section, and I found one of his novels. So apparently, his his plea for attention was successful. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, it, it's a straightforward answer. And I think most people, if we're if we're looking at uh, you know, a thousand embryos versus one toddler or one newborn or whatever age you want to you want to give that child. Mm-hmm. I think most people's inclination would be to save the child, and I don't think that they're uh, that they are are. Uh, 
inconsistent for doing so because number one, we're talking about a, a dire de- life or death situation, and so what someone does in the heat of in the heat of battle, whether it's right or not, cannot be used against them uh, when, when we're talking when we're you know reflecting rationally mm-hmm. on on what is the truth. You know, they they might grab the child because it looks human, or in, these other embryos don't, and so they can I- identify with the suffering of this child, or they know that the the older child is going to suffer terribly in the fire that he's formed relationships with other people, those kinds of things. And so that might be the reason why someone grabs the toddler over the embryos. Mm -hmm. But we can also flip it around because we can also think of certain situations in which someone might save the embryos over the toddler. What if there's a scientist, what if the person uh, left behind at that IVF clinic is the scientist who is the father of those embryos? Well, then we can see that it would be reasonable for the for the father of those embryos to save the embryos over the over the one toddler because mm-hmm. they're his offspring. Mm-hmm. So, so the general, so, so this doesn't show what the pro-choice person thinks it shows, because uh, when we talk about abortion, we're talking about who we're we going to kill. But when we talk about the burning IVF scenario, we're talking about uh, who we're going to save. And so, there, there are two different questions. And, and this, like I said, this is not a new or novel thought experiment. Uh, I responded to this five years ago on my blog, and I uh, I referenced the works of guys like uh, Robert George, uh, Christopher Tollison, um, uh, Christopher Kayser, Frank Beckwith, and they, so obviously they had all responded to these earlier in their own writings. So yeah, this has been responded to a lot of times by pro-life people. And so this really doesn't show what the pro-choice person thinks it does. And so what, what I usually say is, um, I can see myself saving the 1,000 embryos if all things are equal. Uh, but the problem is all things are not equal. We're, we're like, I look at this like a case of triage. If I save the one or two-year-old child, then that child has a 100% chance of success or a chance of survival if I save that child. Whereas if I save the embryos, I have no idea what their fate is. They could be slated for experimentation. They could, ex- they could be slated for implantation. But even then, if you try to implant them into a woman's uterus, there's no guarantee that they'll take, they might all die. So I have no idea what the fate, or they, they might just be uh, slated for, for freezing for later use. So I have no idea what the fate of these embryos are. I do know what the fate of that older child is if I save the toddler. So I would save the toddler because of triage, because there's no situation in which I could ever be 100% certain that those embryos would survive if I save them. The only way I could see myself saving the embryos is if absolutely everything was equal. If I knew that all 1,000 embryos would be implanted, that all of them would would implant and that all of them would would be born healthy, then I would save the 1,000 embryos because all things are equal and I'm saving 1,000 people over saving one person. But all things are not equal. And so I I don't think there's any situation in which I could ever be that sure. So I would save the toddler myself. But I could see myself saving the embryos if all things were equal. You know, an analogy I was saying as we were were talking about this is imagine – you and I and my wife are walking down the street together or something, and some disaster is happening, and I can only save myself and one of you two. No offense, Clinton, but it was nice <laughs> knowing you. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I wouldn't expect anything. Uh, I wouldn't expect anything less. I would expect you to save your wife over me. Yeah, you know, and if, if I didn't, I'd probably be the only person ever cured again in the afterlife. <laughs> Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, mean, I think this does get to the whole point when you said about this guy was blocking people on Twitter who was answering questions that maybe sometimes these people don't always want the answers. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's that's true too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think that this was a situation in which um, in which he probably wasn't looking for an honest answer. He just uh, you know uh, just wants to be confirmed in his in his pro choice views. Because I, I didn't see him engaging uh, with the pro-life people who uh, who commented. He may have engaged with one or two, but for the most part, he was blocking a lot of people. Mm. So when we get back to motivating church and such, could it also be that part of it is we just live in such an individualistic culture, and we can turn on the news and say, hey, do you hear about all those protests going on in Iran and such, and think about all those people and what's going on over there and such. That, hey, let's see what's on Netflix now. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and, you know, there, there have been. I've seen some studies that have been done that show that we, uh, 
that we sympathize with and uh, and respond to the suffering of less than than the suffering of more. And so, if we see one homeless person, we might uh, you know reach in our pocket and give him a, a you know a twenty dollar bill or something and say, here, go you know go eat something. But we might not be that sympathetic when it comes to a large disaster like a you know mm-hmm. um, a devastating earthquake in Peru or something. And, and it's just you know we 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 tend to sympathize with the suffering of of one uh, over. The suffering of of a lot, and um, you know, I, I, they they gave like some kind of psychological reason why that is so. I don't remember what the reason is, but yeah, it's it's really hard to get people motivated, especially when it comes to something like abortion. You know, because even myself, as a pro life advocate who believes that it's it's a that it's a travesty that it's legal, uh, and who wants to see Roe v. Wade overturned and all states make abortion illegal uh it, it, it's overwhelming even to me because you know because we, we you know we have to change the minds of the people in the culture because because it's ingrained in our culture but we also have to change the minds of politicians and politicians for the most part are not interested in doing the right thing they're interested in keeping their supporters happy so we also have to uh to get politicians to to want to do the right thing as well and as we've seen with the Supreme Court uh, you know throughout the ages we saw it with uh, with the um uh, with the Dred Scott decision, we saw it with the Roe v. Wade decision, we saw it with o- Obergefell v. Hodges, and we're seeing it again um, with with the uh, with these uh, conservative business owners who don't want to bake cakes for for same sex weddings. That the Supreme Court and the the courts of of our states are not interested in doing the right thing, and they're not interested in upholding the Constitution, even though they'll pay lip service to the Constitution. They're not interested in that. They're just interested in upholding their own agendas, and so for that reason. And you know, it, I, I find it a little bit overwhelming too. And so, myself, who's a staunch pro-life advocate, who uh, who basically has dedicated his life to trying to overturn Roe v. Wade and try to uh, to oppose abortion and help women make better decisions, uh, it's overwhelming to me. So, how would it seem to someone who has never really given this much thought and who has has never? Uh, you know, never really dedicated uh, much time or effort to anything. It, uh, you know, it probably seems a lot worse to them. And so, uh, you know, so I think that's part of something that we have to work around as well. Yeah. And if we were to get Roe v. Wade repaired, what kind of difference do you think it would make? Well, it would make some difference in the short term because there are a number of states that would make abortion illegal. Because uh, you know, abortion is not something that the Supreme Court ever should have weighed on. Because number one, uh, the Supreme Court lied when they said there's a constitutional right to abortion. There is no constitutional right to abortion. Uh, they grounded it in a constitutional right to privacy, but that's again a specious argument because no one would claim there's a constitutional right to privacy so parents can kill their toddlers in the privacy of their own bedrooms. Well, mm-hmm. no, that's a that's a that's a lousy argument, and so. There's no constitutional right to abortion grounded in a constitutional right to privacy. So the Supreme Court's decision was was really was really bad. It's not something that the Supreme Court should have ever ruled on because there's no constitutional right to it. But uh, and so it's not spelled out in the Constitution, which means that it's something that should be up to the states to decide. And so each state individually should be ruling on on the question of abortion. And so if we were to overturn Roe v. Wade, it would then return. The, uh, the the right to weigh on the abortion decision back to the states. And so there would be some states that would make abortion illegal. In fact, I forget which state it, it was, but there was a state recently that kind of made headlines by enacting a law that said, if Roe v. Wade is ever overturned, abortion will be illegal in this state. I want to say it was Illinois, but it might have been a different one. Um, so, yeah, there was so, a lot so, of news about Illinois lately, so I think you could be right about that one. <laughs> Yeah, or yeah, or it might have been a different state. And I'm just thinking about all the news about Illinois right, lately. But there, there was a state that did that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so if if Roe v. Wade is ever overturned, some states would make abortion illegal, and then some states would keep it legal. And so our our work definitely would not be done because there would still be some states in which it was legal. And you can guarantee that if Roe v. Wade is ever overturned. Uh, you know, Roe v. Wade and all the other legislations like Doe v. Bolton, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, and, and the other rulings, uh, the pro-choice lobby is not going to just sit on their haunches and accept it. So we're still going to have our work cut out for us even after we overturn these other decisions because the pro-choice lobby is going to try and fight to make abortion legal again in the United States. Mm-hmm. Well, Clinton, it's been great having you on here. I don't think we can go to another question or anything right now. Um, 
Do you have a blog, a website, an email way people can get in touch if they want to find out more? Yeah, uh, you can. Well, you can find me on Facebook, just Clinton Wilcox on there. Um, I I actually have a personal website in the works. It's not live yet, but for now, you can find my writings on the Life Training Institute blog. You can go to prolifetraining.com and then uh, find their blog in the drop down menu. And that's where I do a lot of my writing. I also have a personal blog, which I haven't really updated recently uh, because I've been doing a lot of writing on the LTI blog. But you can find me there, and if you comment, I'll see the comments and be able to respond. Uh, that website is prolifephilosophy.blogspot.com. Uh, and you can also find me on Twitter. Uh, in fact, I, th- I think Clinton underscore Wilcox is my name on Twitter. So you can find me there as well. Well, yeah, um. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave today for Deeper Waters audience? Uh, well, I think we've covered everything pretty well. Uh, yeah, you know, even though I think that that the reasoning Schlesinger uses is pretty bad in her book, uh, there I, I do want to actually, yeah, there, there's a, a final fact. I do want to say that it's not all bad. There are a couple of good things that that I that I took from Schlesinger's book uh, that uh, she was really concerned with with finding common ground, which is great. That's something that that I do as well. Uh, my mentors in the movement, Josh Brom and Steve Wagner, are also big on common ground, and so that's some that's one of the ways that I train people to have better conversations on abortion. So I enjoy the fact that she talks about common ground, even though I think in some cases she really pays lip service to it rather than actually feeling uh, that she should find common ground because she, she takes the standard position that we ought to find common ground while still leaving abortion legal. We should just find other ways to reduce it. And so that's not really finding common ground. That's more asking us to compromise. Uh, so in theory, I, I think the common ground aspects of her book are good. And you know, I, I think it's a I think it's a well-written book. And a lot of the things she says regarding spirituality, I think, are true. She says a lot of true things about Christianity and Jesus, but she unfortunately just just draws a lot of really, really bad conclusions from from her Christian faith. That her Christian faith should cause her to oppose abortion because it it is because she should be uh, as the book of Proverbs says, she should be stand, she should be uh, standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves. She should be giving voice to those who can't speak for themselves. So, uh, so unfortunately, um, she she doesn't stand up for the unborn. She stands up for for women. And obviously, as pro life people, we want we want to respect women, and we don't want them to be harmed either. But the conclusions we come to are different. We think that they should be avoiding abortion, whereas she thinks we should be leaving it legal to keep it safe. So it's so her book isn't all bad, but the reasons that. She she uses to justify her pro-choice stance are really, really bad. It's just common uh, feminist arguments is, is, is all it really is. There's nothing really new that she brings to the table as far as that. So so is her book worth reading? You know, I, I, I would say probably not. Uh, there are a lot better art, uh, books you could read. In fact, if you want to read it from a pro-choice feminist perspective, I'd probably recommend Katha Pollitt's book. Uh, Pollitt, I don't think, is a Christian, um, but Schlesinger is. But the stuff Schlesinger talks about regarding Christianity is so minuscule in the book that it's really not, you know, worth really pointing out. Uh, and then, if you want, it, if you want it from a more intellectual perspective, there are a lot better uh, books you could be reading by thinkers like David Boone and Michael Tooley, Peter Singer, guys like that. So, yeah. So, I would say this is probably not a book that anyone needs to to take the time with. Now, one more quick question: If she did hear this podcast and. You know, I was, hey, I didn't realize you were trying to get in touch with me, and she was interested in discussion with you. Honest, would you be willing to do this? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, uh, I would. I would totally be willing because I, I wish she'd be here to, uh, you know, to give more information yeah. on on her thoughts, and you know, because it's possible I might be getting something wrong too. And if I was, then she'd be able to to correct my my understanding of it. And so, yeah, in fact, uh, you know, I, I'm a little surprised because she because her the last chapter of her book is called "Where Do We Go From Here?" And one of the things she talks about is we need to have conversations that build bridges, not walls. So I was a little surprised that she wouldn't want to come on and, and discuss this. And so it might just be that it, it got past her, her secretary or something and she didn't see it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm hoping it's not that she just didn't want to have that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. I'd mm-hmm. be totally willing to come back down and talk about it if mm-hmm. she'd be interested. Well, yeah, Clinton, I'd like to thank you for coming on. I hope we will see you back here again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Thanks again for having me. And I'd like to remind everyone that next week we're going to have Aaron Delgado on talking about his reversal of the abortion pill. For now, I'm Nick Peters, and I'm signing off.